The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Thank you, Gene. And now it's time to play The Feud. Oh, no, wait, wrong show. Well, well, we'll get to that a little later on in the show. It's actually show number 44 of As We See It, being recorded on Sunday, June 3rd, 2012. From Boston, I'm Ed Jupin. Out in the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, we have Fred Boaz. In Brookline, Massachusetts, we have Larry the Lobster. All the way out there in Los Angeles, California, is Gene White. And Holly is... Um, well, Holly, why don't you just tell us where you are now? Absolutely. I relocated today. I literally moved into my apartment mm, four hours ago in Nina, Wisconsin. I'm spending the summer working for Kimberly Clark. Believe it or not, boys, get your jokes out now on the Depend brand. That's right. Whoa! <laughs> okay. So from somewhere in Wisconsin, because I don't know where the heck that town is, we have Holly Hurley. Hello, everybody. Hey, guys. Hello. Hello. How Good are you afternoon. Doing? Good afternoon, everyone. And Memorial Day was well for everybody, I assume? It was wonderful. Yeah. Larry, Thank did you. you ever get to your parade? Um, yeah, I sort of got to it. How do you sort of get to a parade? <laughs> meaning, <laughs> meaning the parade went by and you just couldn't cross the street to go to Brugger's? Well, actually, what was happening is I was doing some research on trying to look up some music trivia that will catch Mr. White off guard. Mr. White? And, and you heard the bands going by. I sat in front of my laptop until about four in the afternoon doing that. Well, that's a good productive way to spend Memorial Day, I assume. So, I guess I'm scared on that one. It sounds like it's going to be a real hard one. Yeah, I guess so. He did a lot of research on that. Yeah. Gene, I you better watch out. Found, I found, I came upon some songs that See, I See, he listened can't just to. let this rest. See, he, he just can't let this rest. <laughs> you give him one segment, it's got to last the whole show. <laughs> All I can say is, I came upon some songs that I was listening to when I was a teenager. They had music when you were a teenager? Yes, I okay. listen to stations like God. Uh, All right. So anyway, getting back to last week and Memorial Day, Fred, last week's Lobster Tales, we had some crazy laws in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, and you were going to do some follow-up research on that. Did you come up with anything? Remind our listeners what they were, and then if you came up with anything further. Well, I, I came up with some new stuff, we, but we, we had one about singing in the bathtub, which actually was uh, a law in Pennsylvania, but... There's a couple of them that actually are more than just Pennsylvania, but in Pennsylvania, it's contrary to discharge a gun, cannon, revolver, or other explosive weapon at a wedding. It's illegal to have over 16 women live in a house together because it constitutes a brothel. It's illegal to sleep on top of a refrigerator outdoors. Any motorist driving along a country road at night must stop every mile and send up a rocket signal, wait 10 minutes for the road to be cleared of livestock and continue. That's not going to happen. That's the kind of road I live on. A special cleaning ordinance bans housewives from hiding dirt and dust under a rug in a dwelling. You must not sing in the bathtub. That's what Larry discussed last week. Fireworks stores may not sell fireworks to Pennsylvania residents, and that happens to be very true when it annoys the hell out of people. A person is not eligible to become governor if he, has had, if he or she has participated in a duel. Any motorist who sights a team of horses coming toward him must pull well off the road, cover his car with a blanket or canvas that, be, that blends into the countryside, and let the horses pass. Ministers are forbidden from performing marriages when either the bride or groom is drunk. No more than two packages of beer at any time may be purchased unless you are buying it from an official state beer store. distributor, which mm -hmm. they have, beer distributors. All liquor stores must be run by the state. Motorized vehicles are not to be sold on Sundays. You may not catch a fish with your hands. You may not catch a fish with any, by any body part except the mouth on the fish. Dynamite is not to be used to catch fish. And though you do not need a fishing license to fish on your own land, but a hunting license is required to hunt even on your own land. Those are, some of those are what we were talked about last week. Those are, those are some of the stupid laws in Pennsylvania. 
pretty cool. So, Larry, what do we have for lobster tails this week? We're, we're going to give everybody a double header of lobster tails. Say that. Okay, because this is one of the stupid laws from Utah. It's illegal to fish from horseback. Number two, birds have the right of way on all highways. Number three, no sex allowed in a moving ambulance if it's during an emergency call. And number four, in Trout Creek, pharmacists may not sell gunpowder to treat headaches. I want you to repeat the third one again. <laughs> you like the third one? No, did I, did I hear you say you're not allowed to have sex in an ambulance when responding to an emergency? During an emergency. <laughs> you can have sex in an ambulance when it's not during an emergency. What is that? <laughs> I don't know. I That's the law. Fishing from horseback? That's pretty cool. <laughs> I, I like to see somebody get tagged for that one. I don't understand why that would be illegal. What, fishing from horseback? Yeah. I don't know, why is it illegal to sleep on the refrigerator outside in Pennsylvania? Yeah, really. Well, that's foolish. They must have caught someone doing it and had to make a law about it. Then the guy must have said, it's not illegal. You can't stop me. I mean, there's a lot of stupid laws out there. I'm sure it has to do something with probably with hunting laws or something that were, that were back when you had no cars and stuff. I, I, I don't know. I mean, as long as they, they should say from a moving horse. Because, I mean, from a horse sitting still, what's the danger in that? I don't understand. I don't see any danger at all. No, me either. No, no, no danger. No danger illegal. <laughs> it's just a stupid law. Well, that's what I think. That and, we can all agree on. And what was the first stupid law? The one we were just talking about. It's illegal what? to fish from a horseback. Oh, that was the first one? Yeah. Okay. Here's the second one, Larry. Birds have the right of oh, way on all highways. Right. That, that's... So who cares, if, who cares if you kill a bird with your car? Well, I mean, there are some... Peter! Areas, uh, there are some... Oh. There are some towns like Morro Bay, California, or Edspin, that the town sits actually inside of a bird sanctuary. And if you hit a bird in town, you have to call the police. And they have to clear you from the accident, so to speak, because it is a bird sanctuary. So it, it makes a little bit of sense. But, I mean, birds have the right of way. Well, if a bird flies over, I stop my car. Yeah, and shoot, and shoot up a rocket and wait 10 minutes. Yeah, right. All right. So we had uh, two weeks of kind of interesting. Uh, I want to ask a quick question to Larry. Here. Where yeah, is sure, Trout Creek? Utah? I, uh, yes. In Utah. These are all in Utah. Utah. I, I, don't know, I don't know where in Utah. And I don't understand why it's uh, why you can't sell. Uh, first of all, why would you use gunpowder to treat headaches to, forget, to begin with? But why is it against the law? I, I guess if a headache's Find bad out. enough, you kind of want to just blow your head off. I, don't know. I guess. <laughs> well, I would think, I would think do that, just... you know, someone was probably treating headaches with gunpowder, and someone found out about it and said, hey, you can't do that. You can't just feed people gunpowder and tell them it's going to help their headaches. <laughs> I so mean, you, you think they're actually taking it uh, orally? To oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think someone... Yeah, I blew their damn head off. Yeah, really. When, do we know? We don't know when that law was put on the books, do we? Because that sounds like a back of a, a back of a horse cart apothecary trick, you know. Yeah, sure does. Wild, wild west. It is Utah. Oh yeah. So, Fred, what do we have? Real news this week. Get us going here. Well, as it turns out, and I thought this was great. I know people are gonna like this. Alaska Airlines threw a child, a three-year-old passenger, and his parents off an airplane because he refused to wear a seatbelt at takeoff from Seattle Airport. The three-year-old child refused to wear a seatbelt before the plane got off the ground, so it never got off the ground. The pilot turned around, went back to the gate, and drew the kid and, of course, his parents off the plane. This is a, this is a federal law. You have to... Yeah, I, I think it's fine. The law is the law. The kid didn't... The parent refused, apparently refused to strap the three-year-old kid in. You know what? The pilot's in charge of his ship. Get off and my the, damn plane. The father of Everett, uh, of Everett, Alaska, I guess Everett, Alaska, uh, told KIROFM that the, the crew overreacted. No, they didn't. No, no they didn't. I don't think has, so. That child has to wear a seatbelt on takeoff and landing. When I flew to Florida several weeks ago, you still got to put it on. Take it off, turn off your cell phone. They walk around, they make sure the cell phones are off. They make sure you built it in. If you refuse, they can turn around and bring it back to the gate. Absolutely. And you can take it off. So I have sure. no problem with this, but I thought it was a great article. The only thing I've got to say about this is it's a safety issue. It's for the, uh, the safety of the child and the parents. 
So they should have adhered to it instead of uh, complaining about it. Yeah, exactly. You have to wear then, them in your car. You have to wear them everywhere. Exactly. So it's a big deal. And then, and then there was another woman who was, and then there was a woman who was traveling by air who was told by the flight attendant, fasten your seatbelt. And she said, but I don't want to wrinkle my clothes. The flight yeah. attendant said, too bad. Stay in a hotel room with an iron and an ironing board. Yeah, but they, they shouldn't be saying that either. But the idea is that you have to put the seatbelt on for safety reasons. I think the flight attendant in that case is wrong with the answer. It should be chastised for answer to the passenger. But the idea behind it is right. A doctor, and I don't even remember which was, but a doctor is a gynecologist in, Sp in Spain has been ordered to financially assist a 24-year-old patient with raising her son in a botched, an abor uh, an a botched abortion attempt. They asked, why is the judge making the doctor pay? Well, neither did the gynecologist botched the woman's abortion, but he failed to detect her being pre uh, pregnancy in the follow-up appointments. Oh, got, this, this guy's got to be like number 600 in a class of seven. You know, I mean, how... Uh, you know, I mean, how does he not know that she's pregnant? Yeah, he, he should have his license revoked at the very least. I mean, that's Actually, it's not he like should. Yeah. It's not good at his job. But, I mean, as far as paying for the kid, I'm kind of for it. I don't know. If, if she paid him for an abortion and it's legal there, she couldn't afford to have a kid. That's what I think. I don't know. Do you guys have an opinion about that? Well, she I think you're right, Holly. I think this guy should pay. I mean... Maybe not the exuberant amount that they're charging him, but uh, at least something in the uh, company he works for should pay the other. Well, apparently she went there. She was seven weeks pregnant and had the abortion. And the doctor, two weeks later on a follow-up visit, assured the woman she was no longer pregnant. And that's, that's the point. I mean, he assured her she was no longer pregnant. She returned to the clinic suspecting she was still pregnant and it turned out that the allegedly aborted fetus had begun growing inside her had been growing inside you know her I, I wonder I, I agree with what you and Jean are saying Holly yeah but also maybe uh, unless of course the litigation would take a number of years maybe she would actually make more money out of this ultimately just suing for malpractice and suing the guy for several million dollars of malpractice which I'm sure the insurance company will end up paying since this pretty much seems to be a pretty clear-cut case of that clear and cut, yeah. uh, well you we, know, don't, we, we don't know what the Spanish laws are support, this you know, happened on the island more. of Mallorca so yeah. we're not sure what their laws are as far as yeah. lawsuits are concerned because you might make more a lot more money in malpractice than you will uh, just in child support well, and I think I think you you that may be a good thought of because it's more within the rights of a doctor to pay the. I, I think there was a definite case here of obviously him having done something wrong, which I think falls under malpractice much more than it does sort of the child support arena. You know, I mean, take this. Yeah, it's kind of it kind of just seems kind of odd to me to call this child support it, malpractice. The guy didn't do his job properly. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think is. the guy should be suspended from his credentials so he doesn't do it on somebody else. Yeah, exactly. That's what that's what I think. Because obviously, it would be one. I mean, every doctor makes a mistake. Every now and again, things happen. And they're not perfect. They're human. But this there's a very big difference between. The, in this case, it's more than just that he made an accident. He made an accident with the with the with the botched abortion. But then he he can't. If you can't tell if a woman is pregnant, you should not be a gynecologist. Yeah. Exactly. That that can't be that can't be the, that hard for a gynecologist to do. You know, there's right. another section to this that when she realized that she was pregnant again, she went back to the clinic to have an abortion because at the point at 22 weeks pregnant, abortion's illegal in Spain. Now she's forced into having a child because it's it's illegal after 14 weeks. It's in beyond Spain. the point now. So right? what happens yeah. is that now the clinic offered to reimburse her the $500 fee the woman had paid for the original procedure. The, the judge you know, fined this guy a hundred, uh, the equivalent of $189,000 and I think thirteen or $1,500 a month in child support. And you know something? Maybe this is a lesson because we don't know what the guy's motives were. I mean, he can't be that stupid to not know she's pregnant. Maybe he has a conviction against against abortion, figured she wouldn't notice her or she wouldn't be able to do anything. But, you know, just a bit, let there be a lesson to you. If they pay for something, give people what they pay for, do your job and do it right the first time. Yeah, but Fred, I noticed that on top of the 186 or $189,000 that they're making him pay, the doctor himself has to actually pay $1,300 a, 
uh, per month until the boy is 26 for years old. Support, right. Yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, 26. Uh, that, that, yeah, the, the 189 dollars go. Uh, 189 thousand goes to her for emotional damage. Actually, I don't think it's right. enough. I don't think that's enough. But the 1300, I, I, I can see that to a point. Like maybe you know, okay, because I've paid child support. I know how invasive that can be. But at the same time, this guy's got to learn. Not only do you pay that, but we're going to pull your credentials. We're going to, you're not going to be able to be a doctor in Spain anymore in the island of Mallorca. You're not going to be able to get a license anywhere. It looks like it was almost intentional. Like, don't worry about it. You're not pregnant. Don't worry about it. You know, I'm not doing my job. You're not pregnant. I mean, I think, I think we've probably said about as much on that topic as we can. I think, you, I think it's, it, that, that's an interesting debate to have. But I think yeah. as we have more cases of this coming forward, we'll learn more about it and see more about it. Um, but speaking about babies after they're born, apparently a very brave Eagle Scout is challenging the Boy Scouts' anti-gay policy. This is really interesting. Eagle Scout Jack Walls challenged the Boy Scouts. He basically delivered boxes of petitions that he got signed by 275,000 people. So it's not just him. There seem to be a large amount of people who are really against the policy that the Boy Scouts have on gay people. And, you know, how, how do you guys feel about that with the Boy Scouts of America? I feel like Larry probably has something to say about this one. <laughs> I most certainly do. I think that this clown should just shut his mouth and mind his own business. Let the boy Larry, scouts it, do what it, they it, want. It is his business. He's an Eagle Scout. He's going through the starting system. It's his business. I don't care. Keep your mouth shut. See, what happened is the, the only problem I have with this, and I, 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 I'm kind of two-sided on this. I understand where he's going. The Boy Scouts of America is a private organization. They have the right to make their own rules. If their rules are that you can't be gay and be a scout, then that's the way it is. I mean, we talk about rules all the time. You know, you have the Girl Scouts, you have the Boy Scouts, I mean, you have the Sea Scouts, and all of them have the same basic ruling that you cannot be a homosexual. And this is just something that's been in place for over 100 years. And I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying there should be pol there should be policies out there to change it. I'm not saying there should, but they are a private organization that's privately funded. They have a right to make whatever decisions they want to make, and you know who are we in, in, in any, any way, shape, or form to sit there and make them change what they what, what their uh, what their organizational beliefs are. Well, I think the fact that they're a private organization sort of speaks to that this boy's handling this the right way. I mean, it's the same thing as if, you know, Huggies came out with a campaign a few years ago that depicted dads as not knowing how to diaper babies. And there was an uproar from dads who buy the product. Basically, they wrote letters. They were they petitioned the company and they said, we think this me this misrepresents dads. And what, and what Kimberly Clark did was basically take that information, change their policy on it. They brought the dads in to talk about it. And the point is... These people, I mean, depending on who signed this, if you have a certain amount of kids and a certain amount of parents who want this organization to provide this service for their gay kids, you can't, you know, they, as a company, they should be listening. You know, as a private organization, they can choose to do with this information what they will, but I think this is information that's being presented to them by their consumer, so to speak. What's important is this kid's an Eagle Scout. It's not like he's somebody looking in from the outside. He's right. gone through all the degrees of scouting to become an Eagle Scout. Now, personally, I, don't, I have friends of mine that are gay. I don't really care. And none of them would ever make an approach onto a kid that is not, that is not gay, if you get my drift. And he, people are so afraid of the gay influence coming through. Well... I know people that would make excellent scoutmasters who are gay, who happen to have certain skills and qualities and that make you know, that, that would be a benefit to Boy Scouts. But because the guy's gay, he can't, you know, I mean, he can't be a Boy Scout. That's crazy. Because maybe, you know, maybe learning something, you know, you might learn. So, I mean, I've known friends of mine that are gay that you learn that you can learn from. You learn important lessons in life to treat people for who they are, not what their orientation is. If you tell somebody, "Hey, I'm straight. I'm not interested," and they accept that, that's fine. I don't have a problem with it. I've got, like I said, I've got friends that are gay. I don't care. Hey, you know, it's really, it's really like don't. that in Hollywood or anything else. You know, look at all of the well, Hollywood movies. A little different because the time and place of the movies over right. the years you know you just didn't want to come out as a gay person in hollywood but music completely different uh, some of the best musicians what i consider some of the best musicians happen to be gay elton john right up at the top of the list there one of is. my all-time favorites and Me but yet too. he admitted 40 years ago that he was gay at a time when it was certainly not in any way shape or form popular to admit something like that so 
there you go. You know, I mean, if, if you could be a world-class, top-notch musician and be gay, why can't you be a Boy Scout and be gay? I mean, you got to remember, there are sports figures out there. There's a skater named Rudy Galindo, who was an Olympic hopeful, who admitted he was gay and ruined his career. And I think that's stupid. I mean, let's get the guys gay. I mean, just, if he happened to be a fabulous skater. Well, like I said, you've got, you've got a lot, a lot of gay musicians, gay actors, gay dancers who are absolutely fabulous at what they do. And I know someone. I've worked with some of these people, and they are fabulous, fantastic people that you know I've partied with, and I've had, we've had a good time all together, and the whole bit. And yet, oh, they're gay. Well, you know something. So what? And you can't, you know, if a kid's gay. Part of what the Boy Scouts teach is supposed to be tolerance, how to do things. I mean, what's wrong with a gay kid learning how to use an axe and build a fire on a campsite? Well, and, you know, you did mention skaters. I mean, skaters and musicians, those are pretty, as you said, I think appropriately, fabulous careers. I mean, if ever there were a place that was stereotyped as being the kind of place that in older times they would consider these people quote unquote wanting to go is one thing i think it's impressive that the boy scouts of america are having this dialogue and both they and he have called it a dialogue about this because they're really working out much like you know the the army recently did with don't ask don't tell you know ultimately i don't think the boy scouts or scouting in general are going is going to give in and allow gays into the organization well, they are having conversations with him, and they are saying they think there are very positive things coming out of it. And so I think that there is, I think that whether or not they change their mind in the near future, I think it's very obvious that there is some, there is, they're open to making some changes in their policy, which I think is a very good start. The problem that I have with this whole discussion is that eventually this is going to wind up going to, to like the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and they're going to wind up forcing the gay, the Boy Scouts, if they don't change their mind, to change their mind, or wind up with multi-million dollar lawsuits. I think that's wrong. But I think the Boy Scouts should be, and especially in this day and age, they need to be a little bit more reticent to what's going on around them, saying, hey, you know, as long as gays and straights can mix together what they can, what's the difference? Who cares? I mean, I don't want to know if somebody's gay, and I don't care if they are. But, I mean, you know, I don't want people flaunting it. I don't want people flashing it. That's fine. But if you're gay and you're, you're straight, the difference, so what? Who cares? Let me well, just add this real quick, guys. Where I work, there's a lot of gays. There's some of the coolest people on earth. Just because they're gay doesn't make them any less than a person, any uh, less talented. And I'll tell you what, there's some people I, I interact with, I'd rather interact with them than some of the straight people. In, I was just going to say, so, I, we, we all apparently have known some in our lives, some gay people. All I could say coming away from it, or if I had to stereotype them in some way, shape or form, is gay people that I've interacted with are more fun than straight people. I've had more laughs and yucks yeah, exactly. with gay people than I have with straight people. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'm, I, I, <laughs> untold. I mean, it's just so unbelievable. You're not going to get anything it's negative out of me. Straight, that's straight, Ed. Don't call us less funny than the gays. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, nobody's ever going to get anything negative out of me about it because I... I Sorry you're offended, Holly, but gay people are more fun than you are. <laughs> <laughs> it's fair. It's a fair assessment. Okay. Well, Holly will say... Gay people and you are more fun. Okay? <laughs> there you go. You know, you know, I don't know. I think I think that particular stereotype does come from a place of truth. I think it is possible that most gay people are way funnier than me. So that's I mean it's just true. It can't be it can't be a stereotype. It can't be it can't we be still, true. We still love you, Holly. <laughs> even though you're in the middle of Wisconsin somewhere and you didn't even send us cheese yet. You've been there four hours and my delivery of cheese didn't come yet. They have to send us a picture with a cheese on your head. Cheese heads actually live in Wisconsin. And I so. certainly hope you're going to be a Green Bay Packer fan exactly. come this fall. Oh, I don't think I really have a choice. Uh, actually, my father-in-law was recommending that on my way up I actually stick one of those not permanent cling stickers to the car just to cover me at work mm -hmm. <laughs> no way oh yeah people are very serious about the uh about the packers up absolutely there. well i've been oh, a packer are. fan my whole oh, yeah. life and i've oh, we should actually always been a good team. we should actually switch places holly because i've been a packer fan since i was like five years old and never lived anywhere near wisconsin but for what? some reason i've always been a big brett Farr fan. fan does that count uh, yes it does <laughs> all right so on the lighter <laughs> note then we uh don't forget donald driver and Donald Driver, yes, you talked about him last week. He won, Get didn't he? Donald! Yes, he did. 
All right. Well, it's too early for entertainment news. We'll get to that a little later. <laughs> All right. So, don't forget, you can bring him back up again in entertainment. Okay. So what do we have next? Well, while we go into our tech segment, Ed, I think you want to take this one. All right. What do you want me to talk about cell today? Phone, uh, the cell phone, the uh, prepaid versus postpaid cell phones. All right. How many hours do I have to talk about this subject? <laughs> You're exactly you ten minutes. Okay, go. you didn't you didn't even throw me a curveball this week. This is a no brainer. Well, all right. Um, I'm just going by what they tell what, what the article said. So I sent you an article. Well, yeah, the particular article that you sent was almost archaic and obsolete at this point. I know um, that, but it was filled, only filled with uh, a lot of non truths. Um, these days, it's actually depending on the company you go with, you're actually making a smarter move by going with what used to be called prepay, they're tending to call it now more just month-to-month -month service, a pay-as-you-go, because even your major carriers now all offer month-to-month -month as opposed to postpaid, which was your traditional monthly billing type service. Now, what was brought up in this article and what is still true about a certain group of the smaller companies, they have happened to have mentioned Cricket in that article. Metro PCS is to a little bit of a lesser extent in that same category, although they're growing out of it. They're getting bigger, uh, expanding out. There are still some carriers like that. You're getting a lot less even though you're not signing a contract. Yes, uh, to get your phone with them, they sell their phones at retail prices because they're not subsidized. An entry-level smartphone might cost you almost $500 with one of those com companies. And I'm talking, you know, an entry-level smartphone. So, yes, the equipment could be more. Your service could be considerably cheaper. We're talking anywhere from as low as $20 or $25 a month for virtually unlimited service up to about $50 a month. So that's a huge decrease in what you would pay with a post-pay service. The big problem would be in the footprint area of the service area. Traditionally, these prepay services, or now as they're calling pay-as-you-go services, didn't use the national postpaid footprint of the main carriers. So, for instance, Boost Mobile, yeah. now, now things are changing on all of these almost daily, so don't hold me, but at one time this was true. Boost Mobile is the prepay service of Sprint. Sprint, as we know, is one of the major carriers who has a fairly good nationwide coverage. They do have the worst network out there as far as coverage because uh, they just don't cover everywhere. Their cell towers aren't as populated as the other carriers, but it's they still have this significant national footprint. Their boost network actually covered something like half or three quarters of the regular Sprint network. Because you were a prepaid customer, you weren't entitled to use their whole national network. The same always went true with your major carriers. If you got on a prepay plan with, say, T-Mobile or AT&T or Verizon, who all have prepay pay plans, or is now that they're called, because it's actually to say other than pre-play, <laughs> which I can't say for some reason, the pay-as-you-go, they all had them, always had them, but they have they, changed that. But they, they limited you, not all of them, but like I said, this is changing daily. They've limited you, and they didn't have you on their national fr footprint. The reason why is the national footprint, they have roaming agreements with other carriers, so that when you're out of their particular coverage area, you're roaming on another network and you're covered. Well, on, pre on postpaid, you're supposedly credit worthy and you're paying on a monthly basis. So they let you go on to the enter into these roaming agreements. Traditionally, with the way when prepay first started out, you weren't cr credit worthy at that time with these original prepay services. And thusly, they said that we're not going to allow you to enter into these roaming agreements because we have to pay these roaming partners of us 
of hours up front, which they do, with no guarantees that you're ever going to pay your bill, so they're going to get stuck footing the bill for your roaming calls. Because of that, you run a much smaller coverage area. Well, pretty much, by and large, on all services, that's changed now. And month-to-month -month payment plans are now on the national footprint, the regular roaming footprint of the major carriers that you would have if you're on postpaid. So that's, that takes care of a significant problem right there. You now, as a month-to-month -month customer, have the same coverage nationwide as your sister who has a postpaid pa plan with AT&T. Okay. Now, That's there is something I was told. This, mm -hmm. I had a friend of mine who I put on the, uh, on the Verizon, and I have the month-to-month -month system on Verizon on a postpaid plan, but he went with a prepaid phone, and he was on a prepaid footprint and wasn't able to get service to his house until he swapped him over to the other plan. So no, there can't there's be no, difference no, no there, there isn't. Postpaid is just another name for prepay. Everybody's going away from that terminology of right. prepay. Well, that's what they were using at the time. Yeah, well, that's... That's a term that really isn't being used anymore. And if you want to call it prepay or if you want to call it month to month, it's the service is the same. The only place the service is different is within carriers. Right. Now, you could go to, and I know it's the case for Metro PCS. If you go to Metro PCS, everybody's familiar with short code SMS messages, which is where if you want to vote for Dancing with the Stars and you text, uh, you know, contestant number five to one, two, one, two, one, two. That's a short, short code SMS. Metro PCS does not allow that. Okay. Some of these other companies do not allow, if you're on a month to month plan, short code SMS messages. Kind of like for the same reason that I mentioned earlier about the roaming agreements, because they have to pay for that, those charges. And if you're on a month-to-month -month agreement, if you cancel your plan tomorrow, they're going to have to eat your bill for those SMS messages that you sent. Well, that being said, that is changing. Almost all of your month-to-month -month services now are also now even allowing short code SMS messages. So all of this is starting to merge together. So really at this point of the game, you have to do your homework. If anybody isn't that knowledgeable in it, you want to talk to somebody who is knowledgeable in it. Not even necessarily somebody that works for one of these companies because they're just not going to be honest and open with you up front. Go to somebody like myself, and I'm certainly not saying I'm the only one out. I could put you in touch with two dozen other people I could talk as knowledgeably about it as I can. Go out and talk to somebody that knows what they're talking about that knows how these things work, and get their opinion on it, and what company might be best for you and your needs. But to wrap it all up, like I said, I could talk for hours on this, but it should be something that's clarified, because people still have the old stigma of prepay in mind of what prepay used to be. There are a lot of good services now out there where you could get the same thing on a month-to-month -month plan that you would get on a postpaid plan, You'd get the same footprint. You'd get the same short code SMS messages. Yes, if you wanted to buy a new phone, you're going to have to pay retail price. Well, there's ways around that. There is a company out there that allows you to buy a SIM card from them. And as long as you have it, it's on the GSM system, obviously, since it's SIM cards, you could buy your service through them and buy just the SIM card from them and stick that SIM card into any GSM phone and it'll work. Or if it's a Metro PCS or a Boost Mobile who are on the CDMA system, which is like Verizon and Sprint, everybody else is GSM. If you're on a CDMA system, Verizon or Sprint, and you want to use a prepay, you could go on to eBay or to Craigslist or something like that and find yourself a good deal on a used and or sometimes even brand new CDMA phone and then you just call that carrier and you provide them with the ESN number and the phone will be programmed for your use. So you still aren't forced to pay $500 for that droid that you want. You could 
certainly go on to Craigslist and buy a droid for $100 and then have it activated on that service. And if anybody doesn't think it can be done, I've done it for three phones. Verizon, I walked in with the three phones, except for the one that I got. There were, there's no problem with it. They don't have a problem with doing it. And they, they're, they're all more than happy to get your service. They don't care. So if anybody wants uh, more detailed information on any of this, or if you want names and specifics on some of these companies, we've just thrown out a couple names out there just because we needed to for the direction of the conversation. But if you want specifics and if you want to, like, basically a list of what the differences are between the different companies, uh, just shoot me an email at awsi at basenettv.com and tell me what you're looking to do, and I could certainly give you a lot of recommendations, unbiased recommendations. I'll give you a list of what every company offers and what every company does, and you can make your own choice, and I'll give you an unbiased recommendation of what everybody has to offer. So drop us an email at awsi at basenettv.com, and that's the best way as opposed to uh, you know, discussing individual services by name here, because then... We'll, leave, we'll end up leaving somebody out, and then they're going to say, say you were pushing these other companies. So well, here, get in touch with a, us then. Here's a question I have for you guys. Do you mm -hmm. get to keep your own phone number when you're doing Yes, paper? you can. All, all companies, that's a yeah, federal yes, law. Yeah. All companies have to allow you to, it's called porting, to port over your number now. You could even port over a landline number. You could port it in any combination. You could port a landline to a cell phone. You could port a cell phone to a landline. You could pour a cell phone from a prepaid to a postpaid. You could do any combination of the above. Yeah, which what which, which, I did, uh, which is what I did when I got the uh, Androids I'm using now. I simply poured it over a number from what was Boost Mobile to my Verizon account, and it went right over. There are still some people who are telling them they can't do it. They can't. And it can be done. You just, you just have to make sure they know they can do it. Wow. Very cool. I just wanted to close up by saying okay. you could definitely save a significant amount of money by going to any pay-as-you-go plan, a monthly, month-to-month -month plan. Most of us and our listeners all have smartphones of some type now. Even if you have a BlackBerry, that's a smartphone. Unless you're on a real stripped-down service or package that you're on, you're going to be paying in the range of roughly $100 a month on the average for your smartphone. Yep. Almost all of these pay-as-you-go services, you're going to cut that in half. You're going to be at about $50 a month roughly. So, again, shoot me an email and I could send you specifics, but you could... I'll guarantee you, you could cut your cell phone bill in half without any loss of service. And depending on what you currently have, you might even gain features and pay half as much money. That's it. Excellent. Well, now we have a, actually another tech story. Next. Well, not technically tech, but uh, I guess it, we, it, you have to see, use some technology to see it, right? That's the transit of Venus. What does this even mean, Fred? I guess I guess we're going to use a smartphone to talk to Venus. Now, what happens is that the, what's not going to happen in another 105 years is that Venus is going to pass, in, uh, for our point of view, is going to pass in front of the sun on the 5th of uh, June, which I think is like Tuesday. And between the 5th and 6th of June, it's going to pass in front of the sun in such a way that you'll be able to see it with telescopes and possibly with the naked eye, but we recommend looking at someone with the naked eye in the morning of June 5th. And something's not going to happen for another 105 years. There are articles on how to watch it, where to watch it, what you want to see. But this is pretty cool, and so it's something that doesn't happen often. Try and get a try and get out there and try to see what's going on with it. But better, it's better than a lunar eclipse. It's another planet passing, and looks like a little dot going in front, of, a little black ball, a little dot going in front of the sun. Well, my recommendation would be, and I guess I'll have to say that this is the official opinion and policy of BaseNet Intermedia Group LLC. I would certainly not recommend looking at the sun for this because you're going to be looking at the planet passing in front of the sun. In my limited knowledge, that could cause severe injuries or even blindness. I would say turn to the press and or go to nasa.gov or nasa.com. They're certainly going to have things up on their websites. And I would say go to a third party like that and watch their coverage of it because they'll have the cameras and everything that could actually see this and watch it safely 
and you'll actually be able to see it more better and safer by watching it from a third party like NASA or anybody else as opposed to looking at the sun directly. So it's definitely from our legal department. Do not look at the sun during this thing. And, uh, and that's a good warning because whatever you're going to see, there are areas where your view is going to be obstructed anyway, and NASA always has a direct view. Now, I remember when I was a kid, they told us, look at eclipse through a box, you put the sun behind you, and have the sun reflect through a hole in the box into the other end of the box, you can see it. I don't know if that'll work with this, but if you want to see this thing, protect your eyes, don't watch it directly, it'd be something that's, that they're going to be showing this. NASA's going to be showing it, the Science Channel's going to be showing it. I have no doubt that they're going to be showing this on TV, because something's going to happen, so it is the best thing. But the transit of Venus on June 5th is the last time for 105 years, and there is an article on Space.com on how to watch it safely. If you go to Space.com, they can, they can, they'll be able to give you some, some really good hints on that. Very interesting, though. It's that stuff's really cool. I remember when I was a kid, the had to be under 10 years old or something. The very first solar eclipse that I saw, and obviously there haven't even been that many in my lifetime in the northern hemisphere because they happen in different parts of the globe, and you only see a couple of them over the course of a lifetime. But my first one, I was a little kid, and everything, it started from a nice sunny day, and then it appeared like it got cloudy, but it didn't get cloudy. It's just that the moon was starting to pass in front of the sun. So it seemed like it was getting cloudy. Then it, everything turned this weird kind of orange because the sun's rays then going around the moon and it was a total, it was one of these total solar eclipses that the sun, the moon completely blocked out the sun. So I'll never forget it the rest of my life. Everything turned this eerie shade of orange and that only lasted a couple minutes, and then it started slowly going in the opposite direction and clearing up. Very, very weird. But I remember I was a little kid, first time I ever saw that, and it was quite an experience. Wow. Well, when you were when you were a kid, uh, Ed, were you an honor student? Not me. Really? Well, it appears that being an honor student doesn't quite pay off the way it once did. Uh, and now, have you guys talked to any about this? Uh, Diane Tran, the honor student in Texas who's been jailed for missing school and being tardy? Well, she actually wasn't jailed. She was charged, but she was sent to jail for 24 hours last week and ordered to pay a $100 fine. And after intense public outcry or teenagers' punishment, the judge signed an order dismissing the charge, dismissing any contempt charges against her, and she's been released. But this comes from a law that we talked about last week uh, on uh, la on lobster tails in Texas. You can go to jail for cutting classes. You know, I understand. We talked about the law, and we all expressed our opinions. But you know, they're talking about this girl who has two jobs. She got fined a hundred dollars. She's she's a high school kid. She's an honor student. Sometimes I think I, I actually was an honor student in school. I had a obscenely high GPA. I was in like the top ten people in my school. I'm, I know it sounds like I'm bragging, but a lot of my friends did too. We were a very smart group. But I there was like one principal who just decided that. It, I had gotten away with too much on my senior year, and she started, like, just giving me detention. Like, if I showed up a couple minutes late for class, she started, like, following me in the hallways. And I think sometimes adults need to take a step back and think about the severity of the offenses versus the potential of the student when they do stuff like this. Because this, some of this is in the hands of the administration to report it, to take note of it. I mean, I, I, think, I think sometimes adults don't think about how they're hurting the kids when they're trying to enforce things that are not necessarily that important. You know what did happen to me? You talk about whether I was an honor student or not, which I most certainly wasn't. <laughs> the only place I came close to being an honor student, and I guess I technically was, was, in, was, in, no, was in all of my music classes. And Jean could vouch for this. Who knew? And, and well, Jean knew. And a funny story that this, uh, this just happened to come into mind when you were talking about this now. I hadn't even given it a thought for years. From the time I was in what now they call middle school, like seventh or eighth grade, all the way through my senior year in high school, I never got less than an A in any of my music classes, in any of them. But then you were also graded on your conduct, like A1, A2, A3. A1 being you were, you got an A, and then you were 
like the most studious, quiet, best disciplined kid there was. That would be an A1. A3, you still got your A, but means that you were a class clown or you raised ruckus in class every now and then. <laughs> so you got that three. My senior year, I still got an A, but in every reporting period, I got a three instead of a one or two. Because our band directors, which she knew them also, <laughs> knew that here's this kid that, you know, we've had to give an A to in all of his music classes in seventh grade. And, you know, now he's a senior, but he's a senior and his attitude, I guess they saw my attitude is going down a little bit since I was a which senior, it was, which, which, it prob it. which it probably was. But their only recourse was giving me an A3 instead of an A1. <laughs> So I think it is an adult kind of thing saying, hey, we're still going to show this kid that we're in charge here. Yeah. And I think sometimes, you know, like I understand wanting to balance out certain kinds of behavior, but I think sometimes people go overboard and they think maybe because a kid's really hardworking that, well, they have too much or that. I think sometimes it literally can be adults kind of acting from like a children's like mindset, not like jealousy, but like kind of thinking, well, this kid thinks they've got it all figured out. I'll show them, you know, and sometimes I think, I think adults do act that way towards kids. And I think it's really unfortunate. Well, you know, I'm not saying that this girl should be late for classes. I'm not saying she should miss classes. She shouldn't. But, I mean, obviously there are a lot of pressures on kids these days, and she's keeping her grades up, and I don't understand why she should be punished for that. But they also need to find out why, you know, what's the, 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 the as we call it here in Basin, the backstory. Why is this girl late for class every day? Why did she miss 18 days in the six-month period in Texas law only allowed 10? I mean, are, is there a reason? I mean, is, is this girl taking care of her brother's because her parents are split up. I mean, there's a lot behind this girl. Now, she's an honor student, and she's getting the grades. And I'm not saying that they should exempt her from this stuff, but putting her in jail, I think it's a little ridiculous. I mean, as a girl like this, if she's able to study, if she has to take care of her kids, institute like a program they have here in Pennsylvania of cyber school, allow her to go to school via computer, so she can stay home and take care of her, uh, of her siblings. She doesn't have to worry about making the 180 days or the 189 days or whatever they got to make, that, that she's able to go to school from home and not miss those 18 days. That would be the solution I'd come up with anyway. Well, I think the problem with, I think it's more important that they find out why this is happening and try to maybe re reach out to helping her get to school and things on time. I think that's a more important policy because if you enact something like a work from home or something like that, then you're, th that's such a slippery slope because there, you know, it's just like the hardship license in Texas. It's something that kids will take advantage of or families even will take advantage of under circum certain circumstances and kids need to go to school. And I think the problem is a lot of other people, the well-intentioned ones, even if you really regulate it, you can't draw the line between the well-intentioned ones and those who are who can prove that they need it but don't necessarily need to do it. I think, I think going to school is an important part of socializing your kids and also teaching them responsibility. You know, if you miss that many days of work, you're going to have some questions from your boss. If you have a good boss, they're going to balance your value against the problems that you're having. Just like in school, you balance the value of the student against the problems that they're having and see if you can help them and see if you can make it better for them. I think I think I think there needs to be a balance there, but I don't think that balance can be take home school because that's that could get out of control. And it needs to be a policy that you can enact for other students when they work hard and make good grades. I have a question about cyber schools, Fred. You know, you could probably answer this question better yeah, than most. The interaction with other kids, probably one of my least favorite subjects, getting back to school days then, not that it's a subject, but gym, gym class. In cyber schools, where's this interaction with other kids and playing sports and having that gym class? I, I seem to think you need this interaction with other kids. There are circumstances where in cyber schools in Pennsylvania, it's not required in the same way you have to take health classes instead or family living classes. Because what happens, a lot of the kids that go to cyber school, like my stepson, go they're going because the interaction with the other kids can be healthy, da be dangerous for them. An example, he has a low immune system. And during the winter, he would be on the bus with kids that are sick. He'd make yeah, he's one better day. off being away from the other so kids. So he right. winds up being away from school more than he's in school. So we had to make a choice between putting him in school where he's going to get the interaction with the kids, which gets him sick for four days out of five, or keeping him home on cyber school where he goes to school at almost at his own leisure. I've gotten up 
And I've seen him on, uh, go to school on Sunday during holidays at 2 o'clock in the morning, at 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, because you could do your work at your own leisure, right? At your own right. leisure, at your own pace, and you don't, the interaction is not there. But, you know, some of the kids I've seen that these kids interact with. You don't want to interact with them in the first place. Well, well uh, and I think in the case of your son, Fred, he is a prime candidate. Thank God that exists for him. But I think if you integrate it for for all kinds of kids who don't have the mental, physical, uh, well, basically the physical borders are really more the problem than anything, that there's a, that's a different thing. And there's also something else that, that, that these kids, that there are kids that, you know, their parents move around or they can, they can, they can still attend a school in Pennsylvania, but live in New Jersey, even where you'd be able to set up that way or whatever situation is. So there's yeah, a lot just of like colleges, you know, the, uh, University of Phoenix was like the very first one that started it, and now literally every single college down to community college offers online classes. So even in college, it's the up-and-coming thing. And that's, how Ju that's how Julie's taking her master's. Yeah, right. right. You were saying that, yeah. Full yeah. sale University in Florida, you know, so. And, and, that, and that's important because, you know, Julie... At the age she that doesn't have the, the, the means or to, to, to be traveling to Florida to go to school she wants to go to. She gets exactly. a master's in communication. I mean, I spent a lot of years working two jobs, working a job, going to school nights, getting literally an hour sleep a night, going to work again, just so I could get so I could get the degrees that I have. You know, the idea, and I don't think that, that there's nothing wrong with that, but in certain cases, you have to make an exception. Now, when he goes on, on the computer, he doesn't go on, log on, and walk away. They, it's to a secure server, a dedicated server, that they own, that they can They're follow. monitoring him, yeah. They monitor him. Right. And if my wife and him go to visit her sister in New Jersey, they have to notify the school that he's going to be coming in from a different server. They know he's coming from New Jersey. Yeah, because it goes by IP addresses. So they know what's going on. They have the IP address where he's at. So and he winds up and he wind, he gets like he was taking American history, 1960s American history last year. I had him watch a History Channel program for four hours on the Kennedy assassination. He got to, he got an hour's class to, uh, an hour's class credit for it. So there's a lot you can do, and a lot of people talk about how they don't like the kids to be indoctrinated by the teachers. Well, I don't get that. The kid learns what he learns what I want him to learn. He learns what the school, what the state requires him to learn, and what we want him to learn. So that he's learning what I consider to be a quality education rather than learning what's being spoon fed to him from the school systems. Sounds like a win win to me. Yeah, me too. All right, what's next? Well, what comes up next is our entertainment section. Woohoo! Also known yeah. as also known as the Who Cares segment. Who cares? Anyway, it's all right. <laughs> So, Gene, what do you want to talk about this week? Well, I guess we can talk about duets. Have you seen duets yet? Have I seen what yet? Duets. Two ads. On, uh, on two ads. Oh, two ads oh, are better than one. Oh, <laughs> oh. Cute. I watched A duet that. where they have the uh, four stars. Uh, let's see. John. It's not Mayor. It's the other one. Kelly Clarkson. Oh, also, duets. The Jennifer, show duets. Yeah, duets. Yeah. I haven't Devils, watched it. I'm mean, frankly well, over right. voice shows. Okay. I'm over it. I'm over. I used to love watching people sing. Then I got too into it, and now I can't take it. I'm over it. I don't want any more singing shows. No more. I'm tapped okay. out. Yeah. At this point, that's how I feel about them. Okay. <laughs> I know. I'm with. I know. I'm with Fred on that. I, however, I never get tired of movies. No. Did you Did you see any movies this weekend? I did not. Well, you know, Snow White and the Huntsman actually beat Men in Black Three at the box office. That I did know. Yes. Why do you Why do you think that is? Do you think it's just because this franchise is is growing old, the Men in Black franchise, or do you think it's because Kristen Stewart and Chris Hemsworth are so hot right now? What What do you think the reason would be for that, Jane? I don't know. Maybe you know, like you said, uh, they're re redoing or actually uh, giving you a third version of Men in Black and. I think people get tired after the first or second ones, and then the third one they just think is uh, it's going to be a rehash of everything that's already been on screen. And um, I think the um, it's a lot different too for um, for like us baby boomers. You know, Snow White is something that we grew up with, 
So we'd rather see something with uh, Snow White and the Huntsman versus Men in Black 3, you know, type of situation. So I think it all depends on the age, the demographics, and the uh, popularity out there. Yeah, I think that I think that's probably true. Now, I I haven't I didn't actually see either of these this weekend while I was stranded uh, trying to drive up to Nina. My car died in Litchfield, Illinois, and I ended up seeing uh, what to expect, which I thought was funny, but not. It was a little too predictable. It was one of those comedies that when you meet the couples, you pretty much know what's going to happen to them. <laughs> and I thought that was unfortunate because the commercials were great, and those parts with the guys together in the group, like talking about being dads awesome but i just i think there were there were some setups that they definitely delivered on all their setups but they sort of made it too easy to figure out what's going to happen to everybody and i thought that was that was unfortunate but the i mean inevitably it's kind of like titanic you know my dad used to say they're going to hit that they're all going to go down spoiler alert the titanic sinks you know it's kind of <laughs> like hey they're pregnant women guess what they're going to have babies you know <laughs> So that was that was a little more, you know. Hey, they're gonna have hot flashes or whatever. Or, hey, they're gonna have their water break. So there, there's some of that. But I think I think it was still funny. I think if you can Netflix it, it might be worth it. But I'm excited to see Snow White and the Huntsman because that's one that even my husband wants to go to, and that's always impressive. I am too, and I'm also looking forward, even though it's a third in the series, uh, Madagascar three. Really, you like Madagascar the three? Movies. Looks really, really good. <laughs> are you a huge Ben Stiller fan? Is that the the impulse there? I am to a degree. I mean, there's some stuff he's done that's been crap, but there are a few things out there that I really enjoy him in. So I think, yeah, it's probably one of the reasons. Love Chris Rock. Yeah, definitely gonna be. So, there. so now, are you gonna watch the Miss USA pageant this week? <laughs> I haven't planned on it. Uh, <laughs> and the MTV I, MTV I, Music I Awards it, right? as well. Yeah, it's a it's a big yeah. week. Uh, yeah, it's a big week for that. And this year, you're gonna be able to tweet live tweet to the Miss USA pageant. So, oh my gosh, she looks so fat in that dress. Will uh will come up as well as did she really just say world peace? <laughs> I hope that world peace trends on Twitter this weekend or this coming week. That'd be awesome. <laughs> as far as the MTV uh, MTV Movie Awards, they were filming yesterday over at uh, <clears throat> my company for that. <laughs> That's awesome. Any, any, did you see, are you allowed to say if you saw anyone famous and awesome? I didn't see anybody favorite famous. I wish I could have, but unfortunately it was like, um, a little far away from where I usually work. So I didn't get a chance to see anybody, but I know they were filming yesterday. Man, that's a bummer. I would have loved to hear all the gossip on, uh, <laughs> on what's going on with that. That'd be pretty awesome. Yeah, Is do. there anybody you're rooting for at the MTV? Any of the movies you're rooting for at the MTV Movie Awards? I think I'd like to see the artist do good. Really? At yeah, the, MP- the MTV Movie Awards? Mm-hmm. Now, that, that to me is more of an Oscar contender. The MTV Movie Awards is where I want to see things like The Hunger Games and Harry Potter really take it home, or like Bridesmaids. I want Bridesmaids to take something home as a cast. I loved that movie. I thought it was great. Or like Best Kiss. Do you have a pick for the Best Kiss category? Oh, it's between uh, Emma, Emma Gosling and Ryan, uh, Emma Stone and Ryan Gosling in Crazy Stupid Love, Emma Watson and Rupert Grint in Deathly Hallows. That's, Jennifer, my, that's my pick. Really? Me too. Because yeah. I've waited the whole series for that. I yeah. mean, there are a lot yeah. of good kisses in here, don't get me wrong, but I waited eight movies for it that. It took kiss. a while for them to get them together, but it was a, it was a good uh, finale to get them together that way. So, yeah, I hope they win. Oh, definitely. So what about Best Fight? Do you have a pick for Best Fight? Have you seen any of the Best Fight contenders? Unfortunately, I can say I have not. Oh, so not well. The Warrior is up uh, with Tom Hardy and Joel Egerton, Edgerton, which I'll definitely probably see that one on Netflix. Uh, Tom Cruise and Michael Nyquist in uh, Mission Impossible. Jennifer Hutchinson and uh, Jennifer Lawrence and Josh Hutchinson. I keep marrying these people. Versus uh, Alexandra Ludwig in the Hundred Hunger Games. That was the ending fight there. Daniel Pycl- Daniel Daniel Radcliffe and Ray Fiennes. Woo, I'm a stumbler today. And Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows. And that was a good fight. Oh, that was that was a good fight. I liked yeah. it. I thought it was a little bit over the top, quite frankly. Because in the book, it's a lot more mental and sort of you're realizing that maybe Harry really is the better wizard, not just the, or the better guy, the better thinker, not just that he has love. You know, that it, there's all this stuff that's revealed in the book. And I felt like in the movie they just kind of went crazy with 
what they could do and didn't really think about the the importance of the scene as much, you know. Still, um, I think the way they ended it was perfect. It yeah. really was. It was great. Now, have they always had the category best on-screen dirtbag? No, but I like that category. <laughs> yeah, you you got to you got to pick for that one. <laughs> no, but I love the category. Because I'm going for Jennifer Aniston and Horrible Bosses. <laughs> <laughs> as a dirty dentist i like wow. her oh man well i don't know do you have anything else you want to talk about this week gene before we get into some seriously entertainment heavy obits this week no i'm good let's get on to it all right, all right. well yeah that that was quite interesting i can't believe that this show has mm. turned to discussing kisses however <laughs> yeah well best kiss of the year i don't know I still like Best Dirt Bag. That, that's a good one. I'll, I'll buy into that one. Well, anyway, I mentioned at the beginning of the show that uh, now it's time to play The Feud. So whoever wants to open up with this one, why was I referencing The Feud, a.k.a. Family Feud? I guess because, unfortunately, we lost Richard Dawson. He was born in England, of course, uh, American actor. Comedian, game shows panelist, and host in America. He was uh, best known for his role as Corporal Peter Newkirk on Hogan's Heroes, being the original host of Family Feud game show from 1976 to 85, and 1994 to 1995, and then for being a regular panelist on the 1970s version of Match Game on CBS from 73 to 78. He was also famous for his final film role, that of Damon Killian, host of The Running Man, in the uh, 1987 film, also uh, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, he's, uh, he's had a pretty long uh, career in the business, so we're going to miss Richard Dawson very much. We lost a, vo- uh, a gentleman by the name of Dick Beals. And Dick Beals was the voice of Gumby, the little stick character we all used to see as children with his horse Pokey. But Dick Beals did more than just that. He did the voice of a lot of other, of other characters. Back in the 1960s, he did work on Gumby, Davy and Goliath, which is a, almost, a, almost a pre-claimation type thing about a young boy and his dog and Bible stories. He also did more than 200 Alka-Seltzer commercials. They had between 1954 and 1964, 1954 and 64, doing the voice of Speedy Alka-Seltzer. He uh, pitched Oscar Mayer, Campbell's Soup, Bob's Big Boy, and more brands than, than, than you'll ever know. Dick Beals died at 80. He was 85 years old. He died in Los Angeles. He died at the Vista Garden, Gardens Memory Care Center in Vista. He was an animation pioneer whose radio and t- TV career spanned seven decades. He stood four feet six inches tall, weighed less than 70 pounds, and had a voice that hadn't changed since grade school because of a glandular condition. And like we said, he died at 85 years old. Tell you what, I'd like to do half of what this guy did as far as voiceovers, because this guy is really fortunate to do what he's done. As a matter of fact, I was just looking through this stuff. In 1996, he actually provided the voice of the Pinocchio puppet in the horror film Pinocchio's Revenge. (laughs) So I thought that was pretty interesting as well. People don't realize that what these people do as far as voiceover, how many voices are the same people. When you look at some of your cartoons that went on during the 50s and 60s, go back and look at the, actually look at the credits, especially if you, can, if you can do that at the stop action we can do now with the DVRs. Stop action, look at some of the voices of some of these people. Dawes Butler, Gene Vanderpil, B. Benedict, all of these people did multiple voices on TV and as, as did Dick Beals. Hey, let's not forget June Foray, who did the uh, voice of Rocky in the Rocky and Bullwinkle uh, cartoons. She did other stuff, too, but she was uh, very talented herself. Well, speaking of uh, talented people who died this week, Doc Watson, who was a very famous singer-songwriter, he's won a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award on top of seven Grammys, and his skill was he could flat pick uh, that sort of traditional American sound. Uh, on the guitar and he is an absolutely amazing or was an absolutely amazing performer and of course a lot of musicians cite him as being their biggest influence and I'm sure there's going to be a huge gap in the music world this week because of him as well so not a good week for obituaries boys no lost a few big ones this week 
So to go out on a lighter note, I suppose, we'll go to our ongoing, speaking of game show, our little ongoing game show here. We're in our fourth segment of Lobster Stumps the Announcer. And the score is two to one. Two to one. Two to one in favor of the lobster. So we're going to see if Gene could tie it up today or if Lobster is going to take a commanding three to one lead in this game. So Larry and Gene, take it away. He just might. I mean, he's been doing research all week, so. So you're in trouble, Gene. He was researching this yes. until 4 in the afternoon. So take it away, Larry. 73 men sailed up from the San Francisco Bay, rolled off of their ship, and here's what they had to say. Ride, Captain, ride. Go ahead. Keep going. That's it. Ride, Captain, ride upon your mystery ship. All right. We have a tie, 2-2. Two to two. Very Ooh. good. So next Can week's going to be a big one. Please explain to me what that's all about. <laughs> oh, you yeah, haven't been here? You, you been oh, here. okay. Go ahead, uh, Larry. Explain to Holly what our game show is. No, well, I know what our game show is, Goobers. I've been here for this before. Oh. I'm curious, uh, what is the Ride, Captain, Ride? Oh, it's a song. Well, it's a song. Title, that's the title of the song. Now. Okay. Oh, nicely done, guys. All right. Now. Well, we stumped Holly today as well. Okay, now. <laughs> yeah, Larry brings up these one-hit wonders or these uh, song lyrics, and then Gene has to guess either the name of the song and or the artist of the song. Okay, and we now. now have a tie, two to two. Okay. Well, so now that you, okay, so you identified the, you, you provided the title to the song, what's the name of the group that recorded it? Blues Image. Well, I guess I'll have to. Does that make it? Does that make it three to two to Gene? Okay, so you're you're giving it to him, Larry. Well, I guess I'm going to have to go and pull out something which I. All think right, is so there you go. So next really week is going to be a big one. Next week we go into this <laughs> tied two to two. All right, so before we wrap things up here. We always give a plug to some of our other shows on BaseNet TV. We talk about Holly and Jill's The Crashing Glass podcast. We talk about Tony Mazzucco and Viewpoint. We talk about About Boston and our upcoming relaunch of As We See It. This week, I want to talk about a show briefly that we don't give too much airtime to on this show, publicity-wise. About Los Angeles. About Los Angeles is hosted by Julie Marie, and she just came out with a great little report on Memorial Day in Los Angeles. So go to our website, basenettv.com, and check out About Los Angeles and Julie's report on Memorial Day. And you could also go back while you're there and look at some of the other topics that she's covered over the past year or so. And she has a couple other reports coming up shortly. So we really just don't, by nobody's fault but my own, we just really don't plug about Los Angeles enough here. So I think I've said it now six times in 45 seconds. So go to basenettv.com and check out about Los Angeles and Julie Marie. And you'll find out some interesting things going on in the Los Angeles area. And speaking of Los Angeles, I'm about 3,200 miles away in Boston. I'm Ed Jupin. And from the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania, a little bit, le- a little bit farther away than that, I'm Fred Boas. <laughs> and from the wild woods of Nina, Wisconsin, I'm Holly Hurley. And from Brooklyn, Massachusetts, I'm the lobster. Who was awake this week. Congratulations. <laughs> And from Los Angeles, I'm Gene White, thanking you for joining us this week and inviting you to join us next week for another As We See It. Have a great week, everyone.